Tunde. Next Hello, exciting talk. Everyone. So um, I'm a Swati Pari. I'll be presenting on uh, my understanding of the book uh, Misunderstanding. Sorry, Misbehaving. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the book Misbehaving by Richard Thaler. And uh, so the first slide we smile. So I hope the rest of the slides also we will have fun. Uh, the author, Richard Thaler, is an American economist. Mm. I mean, this is not an ideal way to put a lot of sentences in the slides, but I think you can just go over that. We should uh, make uh, a rule that wherever possible, make minimum 18 or 20 point fonts, uh, not, no smaller. So, uh, I, uh, is it visible to the last? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, he is uh, a recent man. Nobel Prize winner in economic sciences for uh, his contributions in behavioral economics. So, um, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences quoted his contributions have built a bridge between the economic and psychological analysis of individual decision making. Now, let's see what it uh, gives an opinion. I just want to make a little comment here. Um, so uh, the behavioral economy is, you know, uh, the, the whole field of behavioral science, behavioral economics is relatively new. And I have seen myself uh, evolve, it evolve. So uh, this is another good example of, um, uh, you know, kind of getting a sense that this is going to be a very important field in a timely manner. I think that I got... Um, <laughs> this uh, view because uh, I was following a podcast for called Eco, Econ, Ta, uh, Econ Talk. Mm -hmm. This is it's pretty long, one hour long or longer, morely, more academic um, uh, discussions between economists. Um, then there is a another podcast, um, Motley, not Motley Fool, uh, um, another very well known podcast that is uh, largely on behavioral economics. Let me see if I can pull out. And um, yeah, I could see how um, um, it's really uh, playing a lot of role in understanding consumer behavior and from there on to, to many important topics. Um, uh, okay, uh, maybe I'll get my podcast will tell me what that is. And I think th those give me, yeah, there's this thing called uh, Hidden Brain. That's a beautiful podcast uh, in, in that general area. Um, and there is one more, uh, and oh, sorry, economics radio. So economics radio, hidden brain. There's also something called Make Me Smart, but I think the first two, they are very interesting podcasts, and um, you will see more stories, you will see more important stories, and um, uh, and then it was not that much of a surprise that uh, uh, more recent, uh, you know, prize for Nobel Nobel Prize for Economics went to behavioral economists. This is uh, uh, what the author had a comment in the initial pages of the book. Stop reading when it is no longer fun. To do otherwise, well, that would be just misbehaving. Because uh, you continue reading when it is fun. So if you do something otherwise, you are not doing the normal thing that we, you should do. So that's what is misbehaving. So fortunately, I was interested in continued reading and did not misbehave. So, behavioral economics, what is that? The phrase behavioral economics appears uh, to be a new plasm. What non-behavioral economics can we contrast it with? So, behavioral economics, uh, um, if you go with just uh, economics, it's a lot of uh, calculations and all uh, to go with the trend. But uh, if you move a little uh, out of the trend and see how behavior or human behaviors are um, get giving an impact on the economic decisions, that's what is behavioral economics is. So there are, uh, the answer to this is found in the specific assumptions about human, human behavior that are made in non, uh, neoclassical economic theory. So that was uh, the neoclassical economic theory, is the economics theory which was uh, uh, in the early 17th century, till the early 17th century. And then slowly, slowly they started uh, um, unintentionally discovering what behavioral economics is. 
Let me ask one thing. How many in this class were not aware that this is the book that we will be reading today? Everybody is aware? Good. How many of you are not aware that the book is about behavioral economics? And why not? Uh, that's expect preparation of the class is expected. Mm -hmm. I've given you know I, I talk to people before you join the class or so if you are not there I think be sure that do it. And then I'm not going to ask the answer for this question, but I would like you to uh, think. Can you come up with one very clear and exciting example of behavioral economics? Just one. And make a note to yourself if you can't. And see what you should do so that that's the answer is yes in the future. So, uh, neoclassical economics, that was before behavioral economics, it uh, lies with the core assumption that agents choose by optimizing. Agents here are the icons. So the author has used the term icons, uh, who are human beings, but economists, and who rely on neoclassical economics instead of considering the human behavior aspect to economics. So if uh, he talks about icons, he means not considering the behavioral aspect to it, economics, uh, those economists. And if he's talking about humans, that refers to usual human reaction to some uh, problems. So, in the beginning, economics was behavioral, <coughs> and uh, let's see the, some of the initial studies on behavioral economics. So, uh, these three uh, are the underlying facts of behavioral economics, overconfidence, loss aversion, and self-control. <coughs> so, overconfidence, um, it says the overwinning conceit with the greater part of men have of their own abilities. And um, loss aversion define, is defined as pain is in almost all cases a most pungent sensation than the opposite and correspondence pleasure. We will we'll be discussing all of these uh, in the future slides. And of course self-control which was uh, most emphasized by the author and also I found it a lot interesting. The pleasure which we are to enjoy 10 years hence interests us so little in comparison with that which we may enjoy today in present. There is a lot of depth in this particular sentence. We will uh, see with a lot of examples later on. So uh, there was a, um, so the title of this slide is actually the title of the thesis of uh, the author. Uh, can you put it So in this, uh, apart from free, do you consider rationality is also a part of? Yes, yes. So the, these were uh, the work from by Adam Smith. So after that, uh, they started discovering about and rationality he, and all. Emphasize on rationality of. Yes. Taylor. Yeah. So uh, all these three are quoted by Adam Smith. Uh, by the. Of course, yeah. So uh, the value of saving a life. This was the thesis topic of uh, economic student, Richard Thaler. And what kind of a title is that for an economics PhD thesis? So um, he, in, in this thesis, he, uh, consider, he has uh, discussed about this example that I would like to come up with. Uh, there are two cases, case A and case B. So it was given to some uh, <coughs> students or just subjects. So case A uh, is like this, a classroom uh, environment in which the students are uh, asked whether they are willing to pay for a <coughs> after getting the risk of dying. So let's say all of us in this classroom, we are exposed to the risk of a disease, a very fatal disease, and uh, we all will be dead within one week. So if you are offered an antidote, how much will you be ready to pay for it, which can save you? And there is an antidote. So there is just one antidote. All of us will be wanting to get that antidote. How much will you be willing to pay it? That was uh, 
one study and there was another study which was a volunteering study for a research study. So the volunteers are asked to enter into uh, the research room where they raise the exposure for this fatal disease. And uh, they are asked to stay there for not more than five minutes. But you do have the risk of dying within next uh, 10 days. How much are you going to uh, get paid to volunteer uh, to get that risk? So the risk is uh, 1 in 1,000. So would you like to be get paid more? And you won't be getting any antidote. But you will be participating for a research study for some treatment on this fatal disease. I would like to know how many people will go for uh, case A, like willing to pay a lot to uh, get the antidote. Nobody wants to, one, two, three. <laughs> and how many of you will be volunteering for the research study and instead get paid? Yeah, of course I knew <laughs> Manas is going to raise hand here. <laughs> So um, uh, surprisingly, for economists, uh, they they say that the um, amount that you want to get, uh, you want to pay as well as you want to get paid, should be almost equal because the risk is almost same. One is to one, one by one thousand, right? But they observed that uh, people were uh, willing to pay very less. Like let's say it uh, ranged between. $2,000 to $3,000 so they uh, but they wanted to get paid up to somewhat uh, $500,000 if they volunteer for the research study. Why was that? With the same risk involved of dying, one in 1,000. So that is the human behavior. So the economic theory here predicted equal amount uh, of money involved, but uh, they see that the trade-off between money and risk of death should be not very different for a 50-year-old, let's say, or 60-year-old or 70-year-old, who already has a risk of uh, uh, 0 0.005 and um, getting the risk reduced to 0 0.004. How much different does it make? That guy should not be willing to uh, invest a lot of amount, but he is. So, although it doesn't make a lot of difference between the risk, it's just 0 0.001. But the money involved, the range is like $2,000 to $500,000. So that's how our mind works. We don't want to pay more uh, to save ourselves but we want to get paid more to participate in taking a risk of death. So, yeah, this is what I just talked about. Uh, now, uh, I'll talk about econs versus humans. These are the two terms that the authors, uh, author has discussed in the book. What does econs do and what does human do? There is a dinner party example that I would like to come up with. So uh, the author has uh, discussed in the book as well as a lot of interviews that he has given about a party which they were having when they were graduate students. So while the main course was cooking, they were getting bored and they got some cashews or some nuts to chew on, munching on. But uh, after some time, the bowl of cashew starting, started decreasing, like the amount of cashew in that bowl. People were starting munching a lot of cashews while talking. Then he decided to take that bowl of cashew back and keep it in the kitchen. Why did he do that? Because it was consuming their appetite, they, don't, they will be bored by the way the main course will be uh, prepared. So by the time he came back to the party to join his uh, fellow graduate students, there was all, all of them were economists. So he also quoted that if uh, in a party, you have more than half of the people, economists, assume that the party is ruined. Because uh, then they started analyzing on why did he took the bowl of cashew back. They started discussing about that. Because they will 
the econs. They do a lot of calculations, plus, minus. Why do we do this? Why do we do that? To come up with an optimal solution. But human behavior doesn't count that. So the econ's view is one can't be made better off if one's choice set is made smaller. So uh, in this case, the choice set initially was eating cashew, not eating cashew. But in the second case, uh, eat nuts or no, not eat nuts, right? But then they are left with no nuts. They don't have any choice. So the choice set became smaller. Still they were happy. Still they were talking. Why? So this is a contradiction to the econ's view that you cannot be better off with a smaller set of options. How could that be possible? So, yeah, I took some of these uh, pictures. You, this is what is waiting, what you are waiting for. You don't want this to happen. <laughs> That's why you started munching on the cashews. Uh, def uh, let's define some of the assumptions of economics. Optimizing, self-interest, consumer sovereignty. That is no self-control problems. Econs don't have any self-control problems. They can resist everything because they are calculating and optimizing. Unbiased beliefs. So he coins a term, homo economicus, those are econs. Those are different from homo sapiens. Because behavior or something is driving the homo sapiens in um, their actions, which is typically not acceptable by the homo economicus. So do these assumptions apply to homo sapiens? The assumptions of... Uh, economics. Let us think. What do you uh, come up with when you see this picture? What, what perceives in your mind? How many people think this person is thinking? Okay. How many people think this person is sleeping? So how do we decide whether this image corresponds to a person who is sleeping or who is thinking? Can we decide that, whether this person is thinking or sleeping? Why if yes. Putting, why is he putting uh, fake glasses? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> who? The glasses do not have lenses. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I took this example based on real life incidences. <laughs> so, um, what if we can decide whether this person is thinking or sleeping? Maybe, maybe none of them is true, though. Maybe somebody wants to throw some. Yes, there is a third space. perspective. Of course. Yeah, then afraid that that's why you can lose your now, here comes the feelings <laughs> of uh, anger, fear. So there is an emotional perspective to this involved as well, right? Which are which is not considered by econs, but which are considered by human beings. So humans are uh, unique. Can humans optimize? Every person is unique. Um, so what do you think? Whether they can optimize or not? You don't know, right? Some people are smarter than others. This is another difference that you cannot generalize whether humans can optimize or not. Some problems are harder than others. You can optimize in some scenarios, the same very person, but they will fail to optimize in some other problems, some other scenarios. Uh, let's consider this task, the series of this task. Breathing, rock, paper, scissors, tic-tac-toe, go fishing, checkers, chess, mortgage shopping, life cycle, savings estimate. In these tasks, based on uh, the scale of 0 to 100, how do you think you can uh, have self-control over yourself? So, 
if I come up with an experienced human, may, I, I can say that maybe the graph is like this. Based on a scale of 100, the self-control. But if the case is this, if the context is of eating raw kale, not eating nuts, resisting snooze alarm, exercising, resisting coffee, saving for retirement, and sharing drizzling wine. What do you think will be your resistance or your self-control of these tasks? Let's come up with uh, Mahatma Gandhi. He is considered to be a person who has a lot of self-control. So his graph might show something like this based on, on a scale of 0 to 100, like he has self-control over everything. Which one defines you? The first one or the second one? It can change. Every human being is different. Your uh, choices are different. Uh, the problems that are given to you is different. Your reaction to the problems that are given to you will be different. Of course, um, you can raise your hand if uh, someone's uh, graph is straight 100 on here. Don't feel sad. If we have another uh, uh, choice here for this guy, ending India's freedom struggle, it drops down, right? He has no self-control on this task. So this is where the role of context comes up. Like given the problem, you need to know what is the problem and also you need to know <coughs> the person or the agent involved, only then can we predict anything. So uh, the author also talks about every individual being a planner and um, a doer. So we have two sides to ourselves, a planner side as well as a doer side. At any point of time, at time one, Planner is some, uh, someone who will be uh, forward-looking, cares about the future, and uh, let's say at time two, we might be having the other side to ourselves, that is doer. Devil may care attitude, selfies, who lives in the, uh, for the future, who doesn't care about the future. So based on uh, the, the, these two, we don't know in, at which time and in which context, which side of our self will come up, whether we might react as a planner or whether we might react as a doer. So uh, for this, how do we uh, characterize the interactions between the two? Because we have both the selves in ourselves. In which problem, how do we uh, characterize like transformation from a planner to a doer and doer to a planner? Or whether you continue being a doer or whether you continue being a planner? That depends on the task. So that depends on the context of what problem are you dealing with. Planner uh, is defined to be having uh, two sets of rules to influence the <coughs> actions of doer. Sorry, yeah. So uh, either the planner can influence the decisions through some rewards or penalties, or uh, it, it can impose some rules to limit the doer's uh, options. So uh, there was an example described in the book, which uh, I can uh, discuss. So there was a case of one guy who was left in some island uh, and he had no communication. Uh, fortun unfortunately, um, a bear or some animal came and ate away all his food. So all that he was left was with 10 energy bars for 10 days until his next uh, flight comes to pick him up. So what will a planner do in this case? You have 10 days to survive with 10 energy bars. A planner will take self-control, try to optimize the problem, basically behaving like an econ and dividing, optimizing the solution to one energy bar per day. But what will a doer do? A doer has very less self-control. So he, he or she, uh, in this book, it was described, the, it was addressed the doer to be he and the planner to be she. 
uh, because of uh, uh, the ability of women to planning a lot more by the author. That's not my point of view, by the way. <laughs> I'm just uh, uh, trying to explain whatever I read in the book. So don't call me sexist. So uh, what the planner will do uh, in, in this case and what the doer will do. Um, so if the planner does not intervene to control the actions of the doer, what will happen? A doer can easily consume three bars per day or four bars per day, maybe all the ten bars in one day. So what stops the doer's actions of consuming the bar? The fact that until he loses interest in the bar, until he's bored eating the bar. So that might differ. The doer can lose interest in eating the next bar after eating three bars. So day one, he consumes three bars, loses interest, stops. Day two, he consumes another three bar, loses interest. Day three, another three bars, loses interest. Then day four, he only has one bar for his breakfast. Now what happens? Now he's left. So what choices is he left with? So uh, planner has to build a strategy so that uh, the initial doer self within us has to take a lot of self-control. So I mean, we need to stop uh, the doer from finishing the first few, uh, first uh, the, all the energy bars in first few days. So for that uh, rules, the planner needs to uh, either influence uh, through some rewards or some penalties, or either here the planner has to impose some rules to limit the doer's options. Let's say, in this case, put up a safety box to control, like, uh, you can take only one energy bar out of the safety box per day. You don't have the option of taking out the other energy bar from the box. But in this case, uh, that's not possible because uh, it's an emergency situation, right? It's not a planned situation. So what happens next? The, do, the planner can impose a factor called guilt into the doer. Define a rule named guilt. What guilt can do? If the planner intervenes, and imposes some guilt to the doer's program, then the more guilt the doer gets towards uh, consuming all the energy bars and not uh, saving any other energy bars for his, uh, the other doers, I mean the other selves of himself for the next nine days. Uh, uh, that, that's how it's a work. So this was a graph in the book on uh, happiness from eating energy bars and what happens <coughs> after eating how many number of energy bars. So as you can see, if you impose the rule of a lot of guilt, lots of guilt, the happiness reduces after one bar. But if you impose some guilt, then the happiness is uh, decent for the doer, but uh, after two bars, so it still has, uh, there are still four bars left for other uh, doers or the other days. So the more, so, uh, yeah. And uh, that's the graph for no guilt, a lot of happiness. Selfish doer. Uh, there was uh, another uh, uh, chapter in the book save more for tomorrow. I somehow missed the for here. So uh, it uh, was talking about the financial aspect or the estimate of uh, savings for retirement uh, context. So uh, behavioral economics gained a lot of recognition in the field of financial economics. So we all have more self-control in the future. This was the um, thrown up a contest to the financial domain. 
Uh, so you invite people to increase their savings rate in the future when they get a raise. And the cognitive perspective of this would be what to do to save. People don't know what do they do to save. And uh, uh, people don't have also the willpower to save. Everybody, their willpower is different. He also has a chapter on willpower and describing uh, self-control, how much willpower you have to control yourself. Uh, the solution they came up with was automatic enrollment. You don't have to think about what to do to save. You, uh, so when you join a company, let's say, they proposed the theory with starting 3% savings. So as soon as you join a company, you uh, get automatically enrolled into the savings uh, system and you start saving, let's say, 3%. So they also introduced this concept of uh, increased uh, saving rates with time. So you don't realize that. If, if you, somebody asks you to spend 10%, give 10% of your salary to the savings account as soon as you join, you might be like, ah, I need more money, I'm just joining a job. But if somebody is telling you, okay, start with giving 3% of your salary to me towards your savings account, you're like, oh, okay. And then you don't realize, slowly and slowly, they might increase it to 3 to 10%. So that is what human behavior is uh, uh, with respect to time. So the, there was, you know, a few interesting things about it. <laughs> Uh, well, what would be a good uh, uh, percentage uh, to be put up, you know, aside for retirement? Four percent, ten percent. So, you know, what, you know, at what point it becomes uh, too much for, and the people will take an action. But um, if you kind of take off about the same amount for from everyone, uh, the employee will think that that seems about the right. That is what you know you expected to, and you don't have to make a decision. Right? Suppose you have to fill out in the form how much you want to take off. Then it's quite possible that you'll undershoot. You you choose less because oh I put my current needs and I put my current needs above my future needs. Right? But if you already take it out and then say you do have an, of course an Legally, you still have an option of reducing it, but you have to put extra effort saying, I am choosing not to, you know, take off what you suggested. Then it's very likely that a uh, large number of people will go with what has been suggested because somebody must have calculated that that is a good amount and that uh, if I am doing anything less, that means I'm, you know, uh, an outlier and, and that's not, a, you know, not, in a, not in a good way. So, um, the other interesting experiment is that um, uh, when you give them the choices that you can make as to where the money gets invested, your choice of stocks or bonds or uh, fixed income, uh, or things of you know that nature. Uh, when you give too many choices, things uh, the outcome is worse than when you give very few choices. So um, you know, uh, in stores, for example, you sell. Um, Ten types of honey, that's not, that doesn't work well. You sell four or six, that works well. So these are all behavioral economics kinds of problems uh, and things. Uh, this has even implications on your own, our own daily decision making uh, and persuasive power. When you want to um, uh, get somebody to go along with you, meaning to accept your proposition, to accept your, you know, your suggestion, um, how do you frame it? Do you frame it as an unlimited choice? Or do you frame it as a very limited choice? Do you choose it within saying, oh, I can help you choose from any of the things you want? I think one of the three choices will be good. Th those are the you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, things that you can use in your own life in, in using the theory of behavioral economics in, in, uh, to get a, an outcome you think is good for you or so you are guiding or advising or mentoring or whatever, right? So uh, you tell somebody, when do we meet? So, you know, here, here's an interesting, actual uh, uh, practical example. You are a group of four or five people, right? And you, you have, you know, you, you, you are this, I assume that all of you are starting discussing your, uh, 
a co brain is a computer, not computer thing, right? Now, you need to set up a meeting to meet, right? Uh, you say, when do we meet? And people have, cho you know, all the possibilities that they can choose from. Versus, uh, say, okay, I'm setting up a doodle and uh, three of the four will immediately go and give you, but one guy just would not, you know, go there and, you know, give you that and you're all waiting for when he's good. Versus somebody really taking the leadership and says, so, shall we meet after dinner? Uh, do you think we meet after the class? Do you think six o'clock works for us? Or do you think we want to do? But give just two choices or three choices. The chances are the, the outcome will be better. You come to, come to the closure much faster. Right? So these are the kind of uh, the practical examples that you will you be able to use these theories. Yes, I think it was uh, specifically this theory that you won the uh, Nobel Prize for the theory. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, based on his uh, nudge theory, uh, there uh, a lot of countries have started uh, building up a nudge team in their economics department yes. or the finance department. So in India, for example, uh, the uh, uh, Niti Ayo uh, has a nudge unit. Yeah. So the uh, Richard Farrell himself has uh, uh, worked under the British government, formed a nudge team. It started with five members, but now it's more than 50 members in the team. That's probably too many to get yeah. a good outcome. <laughs> so, he discusses about the nudge team in, also in the book. So, uh, and he discusses about endowment effect. That endowment effect is a pattern. The fact that people often demand much more to give up on an object <coughs> then they would be willing to pay to acquire it. We'll see with uh, some of the examples to understand this uh, better about the human behavior. How many of you recognize this uh, movie? <laughs> I believe a lot. Yeah. So this was a Indian uh, Bollywood movie that came up. And uh, when I was reading about endowment effect, Bollywood. it connected me this to this. Bollywood, Bollywood, not Bollywood. No, 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 no. This is uh, uh, still it is Bollywood. Yes. Okay, it, yeah. it might be original yeah. Bollywood, but I'm talking about the Bollywood one, the Bollywood version of it. That is the Hindi translated okay. one. So because I got related to that uh, movie only then. So a lot of people among the Indian community. The ticket of this uh, movie, how much do we pay for watching a movie usually, like $20? But the ticket prices of this movie went on to like 80 or $100 for one just a movie show. So will you pay $1,000 for a ticket to watch this movie? Some people will say probably not, right? $1,000 is a lot more. Not even zero dollars. <laughs> <laughs> because I can't understand. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 the range will come from zero. Somebody will not even watch it if you get paid to watch that movie. <laughs> it is just translated to Russian language and it's uh, the release date is released in Russia. Oh. Will you sell this movie ticket for one thousand dollars and not watch it? I watch it for ten dollars. I watched it for free, by the way. <laughs> so if somebody is a lot interested in this movie, a lot crazy about the story to know what happened, because this is the second part of the movie, and there was a question mark left in the first part of the movie. So people got crazy to know how, oh, what's happening, or what was the answer for this question in the first part. If you have that much craze to know, or that much curiosity, then you might not be even willing to sell this movie ticket for thousand dollars. Just watch it. Probably not for some. Yes, for a lot. So this is endowment effect. Whether uh, the amount is same, you know, selling for uh, one thousand dollar and paying one thousand dollar, but the context is different. So you are not willing to uh, do either of it. So for an economics point of view, if you are uh, not willing to spend the same amount of money for a task, then probably they are equal, equal weightage. They have equal weightage. 
but they don't consider the fact that there is an aspect of emotion involved in this context. So, yet, uh, there was another story about a wine-loving economist. Uh, uh, it is also cited in the book Anomalies, which uh, uh, Richard Thaler had co-authored with uh, the next representation that we are going to have of uh, Danny, his friend. So, um, years ago, this wine-loving economist, he bought uh, Bordeaux wines for $10 each. Bordeaux. Yeah, bought wines. Mm. Bored. Bored wines. Bored Bored. wines. Present day, there is an auction, like when the book, when this paper was uh, published, and uh, he is not willing to uh, buy the same wine for uh, two hundred dollars, but he wants to occasionally drink the wine. <coughs> so, what drives the fact here? I mean, uh, he bought these wine bottles for ten dollars each, but he is not willing to uh, pay two hundred dollars to get more. And he's also not willing to sell those off for $200. So if you are willing to sell something off that reduces the price of it, if you are not uh, liking that it that much, then you are willing to sell it off, right? But if you are not willing to buy something as well, that, that means uh, you are assuming that uh, your will, your willpower to get that one is not that strong. So a preference for the current state that uh, biases the economist against both buying and selling his wine uh, is stated as a status quo bias. So he will not prefer either selling it or buying it. This is a status quo bias. You can either sell it or you can either buy it, but you don't do anything. But he would have harder time selling than to buy if between the two choices, if he had to take one. Yeah. So he won't uh, sell even for a higher price. Uh, this was quoted in uh, the 1988 paper. And uh, there is a concept of loss aversion uh, by Kahneman and Tusky in 1984. Uh, the disutility of giving up on an object is greater than the utility associated with acquiring it. Uh, then there is a concept of overreaction uh, within the chapter willpower in this book. So uh, they, they, this uh, overreaction uh, concept uh, Richard Thaler uh, tried to uh, explore with his first uh, student while when he uh, started advising students. So he wanted to predict something which is not previously known about financial markets because the student was from a financial domain and he wanted to do something in the financial sector. Whereas Richard Thaler had no knowledge about some basics of financial domain. So then uh, they referred this work by Kamen. People are willing to make extreme forecasts based on flimsy data. Kahneman. Kahneman. So, uh, what, what do we understand from this sentence, this quote? People are willing to make extreme forecasts based on some, based on some initial flimsy data. So that is known as, uh, uh, they refer to this reaction as over overreaction. So there was a task for predicting grade point uh, GPA for a group of students based on a single fact about each one. You are given a group of students, but you are given only one information about the student. How are you going to predict the GPA of the student by the time he or she graduates? So, uh, there was a, you have to choose uh, one between two conditions. Whether the student falls in the top 10% decile of, uh, or next 10% and so on. So whether the student is uh, um, given, belongs to 90 to 100% of the class, uh, or the portion of the class uh, um, scoring between 90% to 80% and so on. They have categorized the students, all the students. So you will get this information about the students. Uh, or you will get uh, the decile score for each student based on a test of sense of humor. 
So they wanted to see if some behavior, the aspect of sense of humor, affects the subjects in deciding the GPA of the student, whether they consider that sense of humor has a role to play in a student getting higher GPA or lower GPA. So ideally, for, for, uh, from the econ's point of view, uh, condition one, in condition one, the sub participating in condition one, they should give a higher uh, score for uh, people who are among the top 10% of the class and a lesser score to a lesser GPA prediction for uh, like your decreasing amount of, of GPA. But uh, surprisingly for condition two as well, the subjects predicted that students who have higher sense of humor decile score, they can uh, get a higher GPA, let's say 3.8 or 3.9 or 3.95 or so on. So how did they predict that a student having a higher sense of humor score will get a higher GPA? This uh, was uh, uh, given as overreaction of the subjects to information about a student's sense of humor. So they just have some scores. So they did not think a lot about the relation between this score and uh, the score they are going to predict. But they just overreacted. If someone has a higher value in this, then they are supposed to be having a higher value on the other one. That was the concept that the subjects took. So uh, that is what usually uh, people do. So. Uh, this concept was taken up by the financial uh, economists in uh, giving an answer to this question. Would investors behave the same way, responding to uh, such uh, non-significant day-to-day information? <coughs> because sense of humor and GPA, they are not so relevant. So will this kind of information uh, be helpful in uh, the financial sector? And they did get some uh, good results out of it. Uh, not, I'll not go into the, uh, a lot of uh, information about the experimentation that they did for this. For all those who are getting bored, it's uh, question time. What day of the year people query most for a diet plan? <laughs> January 1. Lesser on January 31st, but more on January 1 because then they realize that the new, worry, new year is on. What day of the year people query most for a hangover? January 1st. <laughs> people get drunk on 31st and query for the hangover the next day. January 1st. So how did we come up with the answer for these questions out of 365 or 66 options? What drove you to come up with uh, this answer? That is the most frequent. How did you come up with that answer? It's that is a highly generalized answer. Because it's the most special day in the year. Well, it depends. For some people, the most special day might be their birthday. <laughs> But, but for most people, right? So I will, I, will, I will assume this thing. So you have some knowledge that people do these kind of stuffs in these dates, mm -hmm. right? You know that. So uh, you use that knowledge in solving this query. Uh, again, coming back to icons versus humans. Uh, there was an example of a snow shovel price before and the day of a blizzard. So uh, there was a shopkeeper who was selling uh, shovels for $15. But the day there was a blizzard, he raised the price to $20. So Econs will consider this as a very good strategic decision. Right decision at the right point of time, you get more profit. There is another example, Uber price rise in New York City by a factor of 10 during a blizzard. So there was this incident. So there was a blizzard in New York City and all Uber decided to increase the price by a factor of 10. 
So for if you ask MBA students, marketing students, what will they say, the management students, amazing decision by Uber, right? They'll get a lot of profit. It's a blizzard time. They'll get a lot of uh, customers. So it uh, gives us an idea about uh, the relationship between demand and supply for the economists or the econs. They decide everything based on demand supply graph. What will, uh, so the econs will of course agree with these decisions. What will human do? They will disagree. Because of our willingness to help. That is the human behavior. So in this study, it's more, there was it's a... It's more like actually probably more of the econ price gouging is bad. Yeah. So after this they had a... Uh, some of the states put up a rule and there was a case going on and they uh, Uber decided to uh, with a higher cap that they will be charging in case of emergencies unless uh, I mean in instead of charging whatever they want to do so uh, yeah so the uh, there comes the behavioral part of it the willingness to help so this study um, in this study, it was also, there was a survey with Uber drivers. What would they do in such kind of a situation? A lot of Uber drivers told that they can just uh, take the customers for free against what the economists predicted, right? So, um, there is another factor involved, cultural norms, which uh, decide the human behavior. So what are uh, the cultural norms? Again, that's a question. For every culture, what are the norms? It's different, it's uh, unique. And again, there is a factor whether people adhere to it or not. Some people adhere to their cultural norms, they are very serious, whereas some people don't. So there is again this factor also involved in the decision-making process. So uh, there was an example in Greece there is a cultural norm in Greece. If you pay your taxes, you are a sucker. Well, uh, because of that, uh, there is an economic problem in Greece. But this economic problem is influenced by the social norms problem. Right? People don't have pay their back, uh, taxes because then they will get a negative uh, review in the society. So, uh, for uh, the author says that we need to understand uh, the role of these cultural norms, whereas the role of a human adhering to the cultural norm or not is a different study. Well, uh, that's a different case. You cannot generalize it. That okay, all the human beings will adhere to the cultural uh, norms. Again, uh, there was another example for the cultural norms. So when you go to a new country, you visit a new country, you go to a restaurant, what do you do? How much do you tip? That's also different. That, that differs from place to place. Uh, the culture of tipping is different from each country to other country. So if you are to behave, then uh, you follow the cultural norms of the country which you visit. Otherwise, you are misbehaving. So uh, then he talks about the nudge unit. Um, uh, it's under the British government. I have already talked about it. And a lot of countries are uh, opening up the nudge unit. So the Brit uh, there was a problem of the similar taxpayer kind of uh, problem in the uh, British uh, society. The people were not uh, paying their taxes. So when the nudge unit was started, they had a discussion with a person who, uh, who was assigned the task of uh, collecting all the taxes from people. So uh, they were asked, okay, how do you go and collect the tax from people? You know, we just uh, send a letter, Mr. So-and-so and Miss -so -and -so, So-and-so, you are getting default by your tax, you need to pay your tax by so and so date or else we will do blah 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 but uh, so anyway they were forwarding the letters so they just added this one sentence in the letter <clears throat> so this was uh, based on manchester area so they just uh, forwarded uh, added this letter uh, this this sentence 
90% of the residents of Manchester pay their taxes on time, you are in the minority of those who don't. This one sentence increased the amount of uh, returned uh, taxes by the responders, um, the uh, non-paying population, it increased their, uh, uh, them to 5%. And 5% in such a populated area, it's like millions of pounds of profit. It didn't cost anything to them. Anyway, the mailing was going on. They had to mail the letters. They just added this one sentence. So the people who read the letter, they got to know that uh, the culture in this area is of paying taxes. And I'm in the minority. I don't want to belong. I, I don't want to misbehave with my cultural norms. Yes. So how do you think is not unit can be used in perceptual uh, It depends on your perception <laughs> of what you are, uh, uh, of what you want to do, how, how much you want to play with your words or your algorithms, how you want to include that. So he talks about politics here and perception in the book. So what do you perceive of your politician? That depends on the use of words by your politician. Uh, take away from this, learn how to run your experiments instead of just running experiments. Yeah, it, it's all about using your words. So uh, what do you think if you see this word, death tax? Will anyone be willing to pay this one? No. You pay taxes to die? <laughs> no. But uh, this term was used by the politicians to describe estate tax. So estate tax is uh, something that you are going to pay only if you are a... Estate tax. State tax. Estate Estate taxes. tax. For a married couple and if you have uh, excess of 10 million dollar of uh, estate. Actually it is 5.5 million. But um, the, uh, yeah, the use of these terms are extremely you know, valuable. The, the, during the healthcare debate, um, Obamacare, uh, uh, there was a term you could use came out called death panels. So where um, uh, I think uh, people decide, you know, end of life, life kind of situations and such. So the use of these words are very powerful, but they bias the com you know, think completely, right? So this death text was very effectively used to sort of, you know, make it easier for uh, people to remove the or change. And, and you may know that in recent uh, text being, uh, this is doubled from 5.5 million to 11 million. So um, a lot of uh, people, even in this classroom responded, they don't want to pay death tax, even without knowing what uh, death tax is, because we perceive that uh, death tax is something tax that we have to pay for dying. We don't want to pay <laughs> any taxes for dying, uh, without knowing the context in which these terms are used. So 90% of the people are opposed to something that is nothing to do with them, because how many uh, people, what percentage of the population ha are married and having access of this much estate value? Hardly 0.01 or 0.001 percent, but 90 percent uh, don't have anything to do with that tax. Still they responded, no, we don't want to pay, right? So the last chapter of the book is of uh, what next? He talks about what he's expecting. Uh, from the um, Behavioral Economics Society. Uh, so microeconomics is uh, something which uh, uh, believes in, if we raise the price, people will buy less. But uh, macroeconomics is something we can't agree on the first principles. There are other factors involving, involved in whether people will buy less or people will buy more. So we need to consider all these uh, um, other uh, context or uh, surrounding knowledge. So the concluding remarks are, will be humans are unlikely to act consistently by making rational and 
accurate decisions about what is in their economic best interests. So how do we use this? Misbehaving, do we need to misbehave in computing? If yes, how? That's the question that this class raises. So uh, misbehaving uh, was uh, uh, the term, the title for this book that uh, means you are not behaving the way the usual norm, in the usual norm. You need to explore something else, another new aspect into your problem. And then you're not behaving that. purely based on rational economic theory. Yeah. Uh, you are actually behaving. Uh, so, so the question is: um, um, Is the economic uh, equation, uh, you know, is the only equation? Uh, what, what if you do you satisfy economic equation, and you do you base your decision based on satisfying as best as possible or optimizing the economic decision, <coughs> the demand and supply and other things, or we are driven by some other <coughs> equations, right? And you know, there are many things. Uh, and, and how are people abusing the fact that they may be uh, uh, reacting to non-economic, non-fully formed kind of things? That's why people would term estate tax as a death tax and um, uh, get the results they want, which is against your own interest, <coughs> right? And uh, so it's a matter of then one one, one rash you know answer could be humans don't necessarily base their decision purely on economic considerations, and that there are other considerations. How do we uh, realize them? How do we model them? How do we understand um, that different people would have different equations? So suppose I have uh, C constant. <coughs> constant multiplied by economic decision making plus constant multiplied by emotional thing by, uh, plus constant multiplied by um, uh, cultural bias and you know, those things, that's a whole bunch of those things, right? So it is, if the function is far more complex than a pure economic function. And uh, that realization um, is what, you know, so, so you might you might see segmentation by religious lines, cultural lines, um, uh, lines of um, uh, you know um, ancestry. So if I talk about myself, well, I came from a very middle class upbringing, and uh, so for me, um, it's you know very hard to ever go and buy um, coffee at Starbucks. I just simply can't uh, imagine paying four dollars fifty nine cents for uh, you know a thing. But for my daughters, I don't think it doesn't matter. Even if, even if, even when they earn hourly, which is suppose they earn eight dollars an hour, after paying tax, they probably are getting seven fifty or seven you know sixty uh, you know a take home. One, so they are paying nearly forty minutes of working you know time in buying one glass of, you know, one cup of coffee, for them, that's, you know, okay. And for me, I would say, why would I, you know, take the toils of, you know, uh, half an hour or quarter of an hour, three quarters of an hour of my work time to pay for a coffee? It doesn't make sense. It's probably the rationalization that you come up with to defend what you learned around your right. observation. Yeah. So but yeah, so what I'm saying is that there are many forms of what you might call bias functions. There are many forms of things. It may be cultural. It may be uh, you know your uh, your uh, background. Or you, you might say of bringing religious background. It may be economic background. It may be uh, you know. Uh, so for so for somebody whose parents uh, have saved, and uh, you know he, they clearly saw that parents have saved and had good retirement life. Or well, you know, they may make different decisions for their own retirement versus the ones where the parents never care about retirements, they live happily but they died early and never have to worry about it. So why do I care? I don't know when I'll die. Let me enjoy now. Right? So so these things are going to be uh, you know, they're, they're different factors. 
the point here is though, then I will question who said that the economic theory was the uh, uh, you know main basis for human decisions? What what ultimately they are that's what they are saying, right? Is it such a big revelation as it is made out to be? That's the question. So the, the, he also says that uh, the macroeconomics ah. it should be a summation of microeconomics, like the underlying principles of economics, mm. plus these other factors, yes. summation of all these uh, factors. Yes. So I mean, uh, you know, when I did my Econ 101, you know, the first chapter was guns and butters, and if you anybody has done economic, you know. Any, any class of economics, that's what you will do, right? Supply, demand, guns and butters, that kind of stuff. You have limit, you know, same limit resources, right? But in many cases, resources are fungible. Many cases, the resources, uh, you're talking about, um, uh, are you going to use this as a sitting only classroom or sending, you know, a thing and raise suddenly the capacity, right? So many of those things to think about it. The successful people are the ones who can question and find the way around. So, you know, so suppose somebody poses you a question of, uh, you know, here's a problem and uh, how would you solve it? The ones that are really successful are ones saying, why is that the question? Can I change the question? <laughs> okay? <laughs> Think about it. That's, you know, that, that, and very few people can do that. Very few people can do that. But those who can do that, and I, I'm not sure I can train you to do that, but at least I can make you aware that, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, the way to do it, right? So you, suppose you have a, uh, suppose you have a, uh, you know, um, suppose you are in a buying and selling relationship. You are, um, uh, uh, you are selling technology or product to somebody and somebody is buying, right? The question, uh, you know, the, a lot of this is about something will be straightforward saying, oh, you know, if you buy my things, um, you know, you'll save some money or you'll make bigger revenue and, you know, that kind of stuff. Or your employee's job will be easier. They have all those kind of stuff, right? Thinking through as to what is uh, the best way to kind of, uh, you know, get your buyer, uh, you know, to see the value. Because the value is not necessarily purely economic value. Right? If you, you know, all of us have to kind of sell. Uh, I have to sell proposals to the funding agents, to my reviewers, peer reviewers and funding agencies. You and I have to sell our papers to the reviewer. Right? And that is what thinking, if you, if you, you know, saying, when you write an abstract, think how are you going to sell? Right? So that's why so many of you give us so much trouble that they come with all the statistics and all the things in far data and then, then try to write up. Right now we are going through a big problem of, you know, people having done analysis in, in, in that harassment thing and uh, uh, another one, some other, uh, at least two or three papers going on right now in harassment, intra trends, where people are doing some analysis of data, but they are not come up with the value proposition. They did not ask the question why before they started writing. Why should I care for that thing? And when you care about why, there are standard things, such as, uh, there is this algorithm that has these results and I'm improving upon that. Or there is this problem that nobody has solved. Uh, and I'm solving that problem. Or that, uh, you know, I'm using different algorithms to solve the problem and I'm getting better results. <coughs> these are the standard things. First of all, you should be aware of all those standard things and see which one is the best. But better yet, you should be able to even think through as to how you're going to uh, you know, in fact, what, how are you going to solve the thing? So I'll to give you an example. We're writing a proposal right now for um, a community, you know, helping the disaster community to, um, um, uh, 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 you know, with our tools and all that. You know, we have done for last decade, we've done a good bit of work uh, on disaster, you know, coordination and things of that nature, right? The first sentence is the most important sentence. And 
I think, uh, you know, Hussein knows what the sentence is, so, you know, I don't want him to say. But for the rest of you who don't know the sentence, tell me, what sentence you will start with? And I think everybody in this audience, perhaps with the exception of these two, but all of my students should know the answer of that question. Come on, let's start. Who wants to volunteer? What will be the first sentence? Okay. You are welcome to ask me to define the question if you don't understand the question. Further. If the question is clear, tell me how you write. I'm sorry? So we are writing a proposal for NSF. Uh, for uh, basically, proposal is to uh, create, come up with an integrative research effort, working with a community, any community. In this case, we chose to say community uh, that work on disasters. Um, uh, so you may remember we had SOX project, we have a Hazard C project, and um, you know uh, we had done um, work with uh, Athens uh, crisis, you know, crisis task force for planning on disaster and how social media data can be used for improving disaster outcome. We had worked with uh, uh, you know uh, Chennai floods and Kashmir floods. Uh, and, and Oklahoma floods. So there are all these kind of stuff that we had done. And so we had developed tools, right? We had developed tools, uh, uh, and we are still developing tools. Hussein is working on this location tool that can find, given some data about disaster, it can help you find location. Location is very important to understand what's happening there. What would be um, a reasonably uh, effective thing? I, I'm not sure that is the most innovative uh, thing, but there is a very reasonably effective, reasonably, effective sen sentence that you can start with. Disaster causes X amount of casualties in US on this map. Okay. Do you know what it is? I don't know the, the essay. <coughs> I'm going to check and see. Why don't you know? I think you should know it. I read it. The, say if, I re if you read what I read, you should know. The, the, I mean, you, you mean the figure? Yeah. Why should I remember one number? Oh, okay. Uh, but, um, <coughs> <coughs> That's true. You don't have to remember exactly that number. You can always search and find it. Yeah. What else? Uh, I think we can use the, the most recent example of the weekend. Yeah. The first sentence that you need to uh, explain the keyword of that you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And after that, you should mention some uh, numbers and statistics that happen in around the world and something. Why is that better than, you know, what Sunjay said? Well, probably first sentence will be, why are you doing this? Means, what would be the effect if we could have this system? But uh, that, before, uh, that comes, that won't be the first sentence, right? Yeah. Statistics would be better. Huh? Good. Think through now. But then, what statistics should we give? No, what are the catastrophes, recent catastrophes that happened in RESA? Right. Now, but this is where, so one point that um, Swati had raised, this is where knowledge comes into picture. One point was about statistics of cas you know, casualties. Other is statistics about possibly uh, one of the last disasters and what will it cost, right? No, I would say that those are not the best answers. The role of these communities in... That won't be the first one. That won't be catching you. So the answer is somewhere around getting some statistics or something, you know, that shows the importance of the problem, right? Okay, well, the first thing is why? Why? Why do I care, right? Now the question is what... Among all the possible whys, like uh, you know, cause, you know, uh, number of people who died last year versus the amount of uh, you know uh, uh, the cost that was there for the last disaster. Yeah. Is it the money that's spent on disaster recovery? Yes. Yeah, so the question then is exactly what should it be money? Should it be number of people killed? Should it be what it is? That's a very important. But how do we come up with that? Because depending on us. Yeah. If it is for proposal. No, so this, the answer is, this is, this is where, this is where you should be reading. 
This is where you should have a general knowledge. This is why you should be listening to NPR or getting the news. I do that. So I know. I know I had to go nowhere. I had known as before I started writing, I knew that I saw a very large number of how much it cost uh, uh, due to natural disaster in US to, to the US. And I also, actually I remember the number, but if I did not remember, I would Google and find it out easily anyway. So I, I, knew, I actually remember the number $306 billion. Is what cost? Because of natural disasters in US. That's the idea. But even if you know there's some number like that, that's good enough. But the point here is about what? So if I know that there is such a statistics, which was very powerful, <coughs> then that's what I'll start with. If there was another statistics that said that an entire committee got you know killed and you know it could have been saved and, and that would have been see again you have to make there are a lot of decisions here. I am I have to pick a sentence that does not appeal to just one guy. I I have four reviewers of my you know proposal. I want all of them to say that's it. You know, I, you know that if, if my argumentation will work only for one person, that means I'm not going to be, I'm appealing to only a small subset of my readership or my uh, customers. I'm not going to be effective. So I will pick something that is most effective. I should be picking something based on my knowledge and that is factual, that makes huge impact. Thing I'm trying to impress upon you is that, as, a, as always I've said, why is the extremely important point? Beyond that though, there are further nuances as to even why it could be about so many different aspects. And then how do you come up with it? And there is no, um, uh, you know, this reading the books, that's why you need to do that. The uh, keeping up with the news and, uh, you know, and podcasts and everything, that, you know, that's what you need, you know, to do, to be effective. And you, you you really have time during your PhD to get there, to, to make the things refined, to really you know take your career on a very fast growth. Otherwise, you you will still be fine, but it's like you know many others. What is it that you have others don't? And you know this part, how do you come up with right um, positioning, formulation, thinking? through about your customers, about your reader. Let me, I'm, I'm repeating something, but you know, what is most important to you is, are you thinking through who is the reader of your paper? So before you say, Am I, I'm going to write, I, I, here is the work I did. You're going to first have to ask, am I writing paper? Let's say I, I have a project like either trends or depression. Am I writing for computer science conference or am I writing for biomedical and bioinformatics journal? That describes, you know, that changes completely the format and, uh, you know, uh, what it, uh, whether I want methodical and computational innovations versus I want the outcome. Let's say it is computer science. Then, within both of those projects, is your audience code NLP? Is your audience uh, empirical scientist? Is your audience you know, statistical NLP? Is your audience um, text processing? <coughs> Is your audience already aware of role of knowledge or you're going to make you know, a point about it? That, you got to decide that. And, and some more. After you decide all that, you start writing your abstract. And if you are writing your abstract at the very last, in my view, you are not doing yourself a favor, because um, I mean, it can be iterative. That's fine. It's the cover page of the paper. Yeah. Uh, you know, and most decisions will be made. Do you remember in the last class I was saying that, that uh, you're going to interview? And uh, the interview would make a split decision the moment he or she sees you. Uh, read, read the theory on that. There's plenty of material on that. 
and then they'll be essentially rationalizing their, bi their bias, biases that they have about you. They look at you, oh, she looks intelligent, she looks well poised, she, you know, or he, uh, you know, he, he is casual, I like the casual, oh, I don't like the casualty. He didn't even dress up, and every, I'm more dressed up than he is, I don't like that. The very, you know, in the very first words you say, they make a big difference. That's why I, I'm, you know, it's not that I have fun correcting your, you know, pronunciations because I, I myself am not good at all at it. Thankfully, I, you know, I, I can get by now, but you guys won't as well. So, um, uh, all of those things are going to matter. Have you read? Who has not read about the preparation? Uh, Steve Jobs did for uh, his inter his presentations. Legendary guy, right? He is known to be giving the very best product introductions. When he introduced iPhone or something, he's you know the the Apple uh, conference into where he introduced uh, this thing. Other legendary things. Did you have you read how much effort he did for that? My my humble request to anybody who has not read it, please read it. Please read it. That tells you the level of perfection. And for that guy, having done that, even after having successfully done that for every new things, he would rehearse for 10 days. How much time are you doing for rehearsals? And in your case, of writing your paper. You are, you know, you want to submit something next week and you still, you know, Doing things. Where's the time for rehearsal? Five people are working on that. Valerie is saying this, and I say this, and TK says this. How are you going to get a good outcome? In a conference that selects less than 10% of the papers. How? Oh. Right? So, these are serious things. And thinking through these behavioral things are extremely important. Understanding your Readers, your customer is extremely important. That is important for proposals, for writing papers, for giving the talks. Right? I mean, think about it. You go to a conference. A good, suppose you are successful in getting your paper accepted. You go to a good conference, and you have some top people in the, you know, a field sitting there, and think you impress the hell out of them. Now you are on the right to go and talk to them. Now you are on the right to send them LinkedIn message and connect them. Now you are on the right for eventually work towards getting their reference letter. It's step by step by step, but everything has to go. You go with a uh, you know lousy presentation. You didn't care for preparing a presentation. You're not going to get them to be any interested in you, right? Only I'll be interested because you're my student, and I have to be. But nobody else will be. So these, you know, have, these have to be thought through. Every opportunity you get, like writing a paper, paper, getting acceptance, is just a start of the whole process. How many things you can get out of it? I'll see if I can cook up. Uh, I, I can find the email that I got uh, from Hemant while he went to a conference. There were multiple emails of him. Uh, you know, that, that talked about him having met some very influential person, one person who later on participated with us on a proposal. Others that are, you know, top other people, maybe Patrick, uh, um, the guy with the crisis task force and uh, so many other people, okay? And he would, in the email, send them the, um, uh, you know, summary of what they taught with the links to the papers that were mentioned. So he cemented. He sold himself. He sold his papers. He sold noises. He copied me. If there is some interaction, if I am already known to him, now there is a reinforcement. Because he, you know, this guy is reminded, this is my student, oh great, you know, this guy, this guy's work on this area. So, and, and then after that, 
yes, he, this has led to papers, other collaborations, and all kinds of dividends that he got for that. Right? So, on one thing you write a paper, it's published, it's on your resume. Another is taking all the way through, meeting them, finding out, going before going to conference, finding out who are the people that I know. Think about it. So, see, you see the value, right? Because obviously you go, you know that this person knows your advisor, and you casually cycle, you know, there is a conference tea, you know, break. You casually cycle the thing, and the moment you say something in connection, you know, something is common, meaning both of you know a third person. Right there, you have what it takes, you know, all the freedom to now start. It's like a conversation, the person is paying attention to you. Right? When you go and meet somebody, and you already know that person uh, by going, uh, you know, uh, by knowing about him, by going to his web page or her web page or LinkedIn profile, that person will feel far better than you just go there and, mm. right? This, these are these are the behavioral aspects of. These are the uh, things that uh, you could do that that really can give you um, a unique advantage. Okay. Look at the um, other things to look at um, uh, the committees for our. Uh, PhD uh, students that look at the committees. We have had uh, there was a committee recently where we had somebody from Asia, we had somebody from uh, Europe, we had somebody from East Coast, we had somebody from West Coast, and these were relatively top people in the world. Right? That's that's the kind of thing that you know. Uh, now once they have developed that, once they know they can create their network, it can always multiply. Okay, anything else? Very good. So what's coming up next, guys? Today is Thursday. So next week, uh, I think some people had question about logistics. <coughs> so you have four groups. Each groups are supposed to um, write um, the article. You saw the example article. Did you see that? It's amazing article. If you if you read it, <coughs> so I was wrong uh, when I pointed to uh, Roger Shank's uh, piece. That is too narrow. That's a perspective piece, but not an analytical analytical piece. And you need a little bit more, right? You need <coughs> to have central arguments, and and you you probably would need more than one arguments in your you know whatever position you're arguing. Brain is a computer. Brain is not a computer. And along those, you have to, you know, say here's my argument one, and here's my reason for that. Argument two, reason for that, like that. It's that most likely to be that kind of piece that you'll have. Pay attention to that article, and try and ask. Remember, I, uh, you know, all the new students, I say, write down a, a phrase that describes the paragraph. Look at the article. Look at any good article for that matter, and see if you can identify. What was the mind? What was in the mind of the author? Okay. So that is clearly you, you should be able to summarize in a phrase, less than a sentence. What is what that paragraph is like about? What is the essential positioning, essential argument, essential you know idea that the, the author is trying to convey? Convey to the reader. So you're going to take those first, first and foremost. You're going to debate among yourself. What are those core positioning? How are you going to get those questions? Well, the standard way is for you to have read a lot of material. Preferably from different perspectives. Remember, for this course, we are interested in neuroscience perspective, we are interested in computational capability, we are interested in behavioral science, we are interested in cognitive science, we are interested in cognitive computing, right? So we have different perspectives. So with your positions, Consider multiple perspectives. For each perspective, kind, kind, you know, get the essence of argument that somebody else has made. A lot of your arguments will be based on simply um, uh, uh, taking somebody, some argument that somebody has already made. You and you are supposed to refer refer to them, and make sure that you can defend them. And 
your other people on the other side are supposed to argue against you remember they are supposed to they 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 are supposed to poke hole in your argumentations so you need to have read enough you know to and believe enough or make it believable enough if, even if you don't believe it to argue your point of view right there's another thing in argumentation do you understand do you do you think think about a strip of uh, you know let's say a uh, 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 metal a strip of metal will bend so when you do argumentation you can't be the good argue you know you if you are good at argumentation you understand how much pressure is coming on you and let it bend if you you have strip here pressure is coming on you and you don't bend that means you're going to break you understand this argument you understand right so if you are wood wood stick thick wood stick you're going to break but if you are you know bendable net metal stick you're going to bend and still bend in just enough not to break and come back and bounce back and bounce back think so so when you are coming going to you know uh, uh, i you know i take this argument excess very seriously because i think this will be very valuable to you it's not not just for grade it's really essence for thinking um all of these in fact what i try to you know sell to you is being different being out of the ordinary right in our classroom in our class work we always we do a lot of work on summarizing we need something we summarize you start with that but then you have to get into uh, you know inter, uh, analy analyzing that then you have to get into interpreting that then you have to get into nuances and look at various aspects of it and say what if i you know i uh, you know uh, people are not believable what what else can i do so that eventually i still win right so there is a multi pronged multi layer strategy is multi you know with with more and more sophistication so it's that that if you get that it will show up in many things you will do in your future presentations in your choosing of the problem in your talking to somebody and convincing them that you have something very interesting to say you different to say right most of the times the win is by picking a problem that nobody else has solved but then how do you come up with that problem well what i think these are the steps you take these are the variety of exercises you do so that you develop those core capabilities so that you can do that just today for example uh, i was having a chat with um, uh one of our long time partner jyoti jyotishwan pathak uh, on um uh, uh you know doing this proposal another proposal of the kind that uh, you know we are doing disaster where his partner is a uh, us dot uh, department of transportation in new york and uh, they they their their idea was to um uh you know essentially provide um uh the people who people ability to decide whether to go to a healthcare facility or get a virtual consultation for healthcare that is what they started out with in the conversation i convinced him to do a lot of different things i said that's fine but what if we actually also look at uh, other partner Uh, uh, the partner could be uh, that you see the your hospital. He works for hospital, Cornell Hospital, Vale Cornell Hospital. Your partner, your your hospital should be interested in effective utilization of your uh, health facilities, because a lot of people come with Medicare and other conditions, and insurance companies don't pay enough. So you can losing money. So. fewer hospital stays if you're not making money on hospital stays is better for you in some cases hospital stays good for you because you're making money but there is a now think about it my thought process was not has number of things involved here one is economic aspects understanding the insurance company how they work understanding hospital utilization and how they work 
hospital operations aspects of it and you know what drives them understanding also the patient thing meaning if i can prevent um, um, you know uh, onset of uh, uh, you know conditions that lead to emergency i can save them pain and suffering right uh, many of you heard from me and you know we have done work on adhf acute decompensated heart failure each hospitalization cost $50,000, $8,000 a day, six days every stay. 25% of the patients that are discharged from hospital with chronic heart patients, uh, uh, sorry, uh, conditions, get re-hospitalized re in 30 days. 49% get re-hospitalized in six months. It costs $17 billion per year to the US healthcare system just on this one particular thing. The part, uh, uh, CMS, which is Medicare, has come up with a new rule after Obama care that uh, they will stop uh, earlier. Uh, hospitals will get paid for whatever service they provide. So, while it is not good for the patient, if the patient goes out or the hospital comes back again, they make money. So there is no incentive to, you know, cut down on reusualization. CMS said, now we not, will not pay you or pay you enough for, C, uh, for the rehospitalization. So now they have economic incentive to, um, uh, uh, to um, uh, you know, reduce the rehospitalization, right? That means they are incentive to treat the patients very well in the post-operative care, after discharge. One of the things that happened with uh, ADHF is that uh, uh, when you have poor heart, Usually, uh, it affects your renal functions. Poor renal functions means body does not throw out water. Body retain means swelling. Swelling means weight gain. Swelling also means uh, impact on your vital uh, organ, come back to the hospital. Now, just remember what happened here. And I knew all of this before I went to the doctor, the chief of cardio, uh, cardiovascular medicine who makes $3 million a year at Vail Cornell, uh, sorry, a, 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 at the Wexner Medical, uh, you know, center, the Ohio, Ohio State Hospital. Analyze what is happening here. I am the salesperson, right? I made it my business to learn that business. Right? Why? That's a super busy guy. Why would they want, he want to collaborate with me? Right? It's a, it's, it's a story of very unequal thing. He can still keep on making his money and, and doing his job by treating the patients and doing his operations. Why should he care for a, a computer scientist? Right? So understand what it took for me to sell. This is a message to you. I'm a computer science, right? I like to, I like to do computer science. My ultimate goal, goal is to do augmented personal health. And yet, I had to know all of those things. So the, the whole thing, all of the things, we, you know, a lot of things are, that we will certainly do computer science in this class, but even the non-computer science we are doing are, you know, preparing you for this kind of outcome. The broader impact. Yeah. Well, no, but I to sell, right? And what do you to sell? I need, I need to understand the business. I need to understand pain point. I need to understand what will drive the behavior of my partner. Right? Some may be motivated enough and there will be some level of motivation for Dr. Shim. But what will you do to convince Dr. Shim that she would be interested in doing more research and less uh, in a surgery? Time is only 24 hours a day. And he doesn't, she doesn't make any more money by working on our project. How do I convince her? Think about it. Right? That, those are the kind of issues that we have to figure out. When you do that, you can create the resources for doing what I want, what you don't. I want the resources for us to do very exciting work. I'm interested in augmented personal health. I'm not interested in, you know, uh, hospital utilization per se. But that's part of my, that's what I have to do to succeed. The, all the facts that I laid out, you know, that you know, $306 million for the last year thing. That's what I have to do to sell this kind of research. So these are the things that 
you know, you have to start building in doing, and this, I think we are, I'm so, this is what, I started first teaching in 1994. So we are talking about 24 years now. And it has taken me this long to ever come with a, to come with a situation where I think my students are actually reading books. And developing that breadth that will be making them even more successful than my past students. You know what? You have to go up. Up and up, up. If you stagnate, you kind of die, right? Yeah. I, I'm saying, you know, not, 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 not you know, physically, but intellectually you die. Right? So you have to keep on doing it. So I have to keep the standards of you guys. You, know, you guys have to do better than my past students. But how do we do that? And these are the, you know, well, now we are the things. Uh, you guys will be far better positioned. Uh, uh, more, more, more you listen to the podcast, the right kind of podcast. You know, how, I, the other day I was explaining to you how I'm getting my information. The network, choosing the right network points. So that the information comes to you, right? Do you remember uh, uh, Pawan Kaparimpati's project where he analyzed tweets to create a you know, user um, graph, uh, uh, you know, interest graph? So that whatever the user is interested in is reflected in the filtering of the thing. In, that encompasses domain knowledge, not just the keywords kind of thing. So the same thing is I have created that interest graph. That's how I source is, so information. So these are all the you know, different pieces that are important to develop something where you will have the tools that your typical you know, competition would not have. And that's why you, you will do what you want to do. All right. Oh, sorry. So to finish up uh, the thing that uh, um, by next Sunday uh, uh, noon, you got to have it published, right? Then you're going to read each other statement before the class on the next Tuesday. Not the coming Tuesday, but the one after that. And I will ask any one of all, everybody should have their presentations. Each of the uh, groups should have their presentations ready Tuesday after the next Tuesday, right? So we'll say, OK. Group number one from Brain is a Computer. And they will come here. Now, before that, you guys need to, I want you to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, practice. So use your own group. If in your group you are, you know, you should try out. Pick your best presenter. Your, you are going to learn to win as a team. It is not important. Presentation doesn't get necessarily more mark if your team loses. And the team does not, member does not get more mark if the team loses because you pick a wrong guy. You as a team needs to win. Everybody will win. So if you take, pick your best presenter, right? Resolve any issue saying, oh, I want to be present. Just because you're present doesn't mean you are going, you know, more successful. It's a team thing, right? You win as a team or not. And so, uh, you know, that person will uh, ask, uh, you, know, you know, present that team's position, right? 15 minutes is what you should be preparing for, with a potential for 5 to 10 minutes of questions. So the 15 minutes will actually get extended because everybody is allowed to ask questions. So especially the other three teams would be asking the questions. And I'll be asking the questions, right? So probably it'll come down to 15 to 20 minutes. To, you know, 50, instead of 15 minutes, it'll get extended to 50, 20, 25 minutes. A good discussion is wel welcome. That doesn't mean it's bad for you. But again, remember that pretentious point that I made, how you respond, when you concede, when you don't concede, think through that. And we'll go through all the four of them. We'll pick one. Uh, you know, group of uh, brain is computer, then brain is not computer, brain is computer, brain is computer. We'll go through all the four. You are going to rank each of the teams. So you're going to rank the other teams, other than your teams. Right? And um, and we'll collect the data and Emily will help me collect your your own ranking. Um, I will, I'm going to rank you of how, what was your judgment? So you're going to tell me, you know, obviously you're going to put your name uh, the, of your, um, uh, you know, uh, views on somebody else, all the other team and how well they did and you can, I, comments are also welcome, your rational of what you said are welcome. 
you're going to assume that what your team is doing is about 8 out of 10. And based on that, you're going to give mark to the rest of the team. If you think that the other teams do better than that, give more than 8. If you think they are doing about the same as you, uh, 8. And if they think they are doing poor than your team, less than 8. Okay? But you're going to explain that. And I'm going to see your thought process how you are taking it. So if you're being too, um, you know, um, harsh on other team without a rational as bad, that reflects bad on you. If you are too becoming too, uh, you know, uh, you know, you're giving everybody else a ten, then it also reflects bad on you, because you really have no discernment. You can't say what is good for bad. That's no good either. Right? And so, and then after all of that is done, in the next class we're going to have a panel. In that panel, we'll have another person from each of the teams. So there are four teams. They'll be sitting here. And we'll run like a conference panel. And it'll be, you know, kind of, they'll make again a position statement uh, uh, without slides, and we'll have a discussion, see where it goes. Maybe, maybe we have exhausted everything. This is an experiment. Maybe it will not, you know, maybe that's overkill to continue after that, you know, for the panel. But let's see. Right? So, clear on our experience? Good. Meanwhile, continue. Uh, you know your books and prize. so those who are not presented start get ready and uh, be, should be ready also week after next if you're called upon. Although week after next we are going to be still busy with uh, the, uh, the the uh, you know discussions on this various computer or not but still get ready also don't don't delay because we have other things to do. And let's see if you can get a very refined writing like the one that the example I gave you. And, and you know, perhaps uh, I'm hopeful that of the four teams, uh, hopefully I can take a couple of those teams and that will become a blog on our research dot, a blog dot noises dot org. And I'm hopeful that we'll do such a good presentation that we'll create a, create a video of the debate and that'll be highlight for our noises center on we'll on Facebook and I'll publicize all over the world. Assuming that it comes out there. It can't be one hour long thing, and then nobody is going to watch it, right? But be very targeted, well done, and argumentative kind of things. Uh, you know, good, good hours. Clear? Okay. 